Every weekend, for as long as I can remember, my father would get up on a Saturday, he would put on a worn sweatshirt, and he would scrape away at the squeaky old wheel of a house that we lived in. I wouldn't even call it a restoration. It was more like a ritual, catharsis. He would spend all year scraping paint with this old heat gun and a spackle knife, only to begin again where he had left off the following year, scraping and re-scraping, painting and repainting. The work of an old house is never meant to be done. The year my father turned, the day my father turned 52, I got a call. My mother was on the line to tell me that doctors had found a lump in his stomach, terminal cancer, she told me, and they had given him three weeks to live. I immediately moved home to my hometown of Poughkeepsie, New York, to sit with my father on death watch, not knowing what the next days would bring us. To keep myself busy, I rolled up my sleeves and decided to finish what he could no, now no longer complete, the restoration of our old home. When my father's looming three-week deadline came and then went, he was still alive. And at three months, he joined me. We gutted and repainted the interior. At six months, we refinished the old windows. And at 18 months, the rotted porch was finally replaced. And there was my father standing with me outside, admiring a day's work, hair on his head, fully in remission, when he turned to me and he said, you know, Michael, this house, it saved my life. So, naturally, I found my calling. I decided to be an architect and go to architecture school the following year. But when I went to architecture school, I learned something different about buildings. Prioritization seemed to come, or sorry, recognition seemed to come to those who prioritized novel and sculptural forms like uh, ribbons or um, uh, pickles. Uh, or I think, I think this is supposed to be a snail. Um, something about this bothered me. Why was it that the most beautiful, the most innovative, the most creative architecture was also so rare and seemed to serve so very few. And more to the point, with all of this creative talent, I wondered what more could architecture do? About the same time as I was starting my first set of final exams, I decided to take a break from an all-nighter to go to a lecture by my hero, Dr. Paul Farmer, who's here in the room today. And I was surprised to see a doctor talking about architecture. Buildings are making people sicker, he said. And for the poorest in the world, this is causing epidemic-level problems. In this hospital in South Africa, patients walked into an unventilated hallway, let's say a broken leg, and walked out with a multidrug-resistant strand of tuberculosis. Simple designs for infection control had not been thought about, and patients had died because of it. Where are the architects, Paul said. If buildings are making people sicker, where are the architects and designers that can join us in designing hospitals that allow us to heal? That following summer, a few classmates and I were in the back of a Land Rover, bouncing over the mountainous roads in Rwanda. I was there to live in Butaro and to stay in this old guest house, which was used as a prison after the genocide. We were there to design a new type of hospital with Dr. Farmer and his team. If hallways are making patients sicker, what if we could turn the hospital inside out and make people walk in the exterior? If mechanical systems rarely work, what if we could design a hospital that could breathe through natural ventilation and meanwhile reduce its environmental footprint? And what about the patient's experience? Evidence had shown that a simple view of a window can radically improve health outcomes, so why couldn't we design a hospital where every patient had a window with a view? Simple, site-specific designs can make a building that heals. Designing a building is one thing, but getting it built is quite another. We worked with a brilliant engineer named Bruce Nizé, and he thought about construction differently than I had been taught in school. When we had to bring in, excavate the entire hill for this hospital and bring in a bulldozer from the Capitol is expensive and hard to get to site, Bruce suggested doing it by hand, using a process in Rwanda called Ubedehe, which means community works by the community. Hundreds of people came with shovels and hose, and we excavated that hill in half the time and in half the cost of that bulldozer. 
Instead of importing furniture, Bruce started a guild, bringing in master carpenters to train others in how to make furniture by hand. And in this job site, 15 years after the Rwandan genocide, Bruce insisted that we use labor from all backgrounds and that half of them be women. Bruce was using the process of building to heal, not just for those who were sick, but for the community as a whole. We call this the locally fabricated way of building, or LOFAB for short, and it has really four pillars. Hire locally, source regionally, train where you can, and most importantly, think about every design decision that we make as an opportunity to invest in the dignity of the communities in which we serve. Think of it like the local food movement, but for architecture. And we are convinced that this is a way of thinking about our built world, and it can be replicated around the world and used as a way to reimagine the way we talk about, but also evaluate the impact of buildings. Using the low-fab way of building, even aesthetic decisions can be designed in such a way to impact people's lives. In Butaro, we used a local volcanic stone that was found in abundance within the area, but often considered a nuisance by farmers and piled on the side of the road. We worked with masons to hand-cut these stones and to form them into the walls of the hospital. And as they began on this corner and wrapped all the way around the building, they were so good at putting the stones together, they asked if they could take down the original wall and rebuild it. And you can see what is possible. It's absolutely beautiful. You know, but the beauty to me comes from the fact that I know that hands cut these stones, and they form them into this thick wall, made only in this place with rocks from this very soil. When you go outside today and you look at the buildings around us, or back in your hometown, we should certainly ask what the environmental footprint is of the buildings in which we inhabit or walk by. But what if we also asked, what is the human handprint of those that made it? We started an organization called Mass Design Group to use this as a sort of calling and test this idea around the world on different projects. Like in Haiti, we asked if the design of a clinic could help end the epidemic of cholera. In this 100-bed hospital, we designed a simple solution that could clean contaminated medical waste before it re-enters the water table. And our partners at La Sandra Jesco are already saving lives because of it. Or in Malawi, we asked if a birthing center could radically reduce maternal and infant mortality. Malawi has one of the highest rates of maternal and infant death in the world, and we designed a simple center to be replicated at other hospitals nationally, which would attract mothers and their attendants to come to the medical facility early and have safer births. Or in the Congo, we asked if an educational center could protect endangered wildlife. Poaching for ivory and bushmeat is leading to global epidemics, disease transfer, and war in one of the hardest to reach places in the world. We designed an educational center with the wood and the mud around us in order to show new ways to protect and conserve our rich biodiversity. Or even in, here in the US, we were invited to rethink the largest university for the deaf and hard of hearing in the world. The deaf community through sign language shows us the power of visual communication, and we designed a center to elevate and amplify the ways in which we communicate, both verbally and non-verbally. And even in Poughkeepsie, my hometown, I wondered how we can leverage arts and culture and design to rethink this and other Rust Belt cities in America and make them centers of innovation and growth. In each of these projects, we asked really a simple question, what more can architecture do? And by asking that question, we were forced to consider how we could hire locally, invest in the local economy, and most importantly, think about the dignity of the communities we serve. I have learned one very important lesson from this work, which is that architecture can be a transformative engine for change. About a year and a half ago, uh, I read an article about uh, Brian Stevenson, mentioned here before, an intrepid and tireless civil rights leader who also had a bold architectural vision. Brian and his team have been documenting the over 4,000 lynchings that have happened in America, most of which have never been 
marked, and they plan to mark the, each site of these lynchings and to build a national memorial to victims of lynching in Montgomery, Alabama. Countries like Germany and South Africa, and of course Rwanda, have found it necessary to build memorials to reflect on the atrocities of their past in order to heal their national psyche. And we have yet to do this in the United States. So I wrote a cold email to uh, info at equaljusticeinitiative.org, Brian's organization. Dear Brian, it said, I think your building project is maybe the most important project we could do in America and could change the way that we talk and think about racial injustice. Uh, by any chance, have you hired an architect? <laughs> Shockingly, uh, Brian got right back to me uh, and invited me to come meet with his team in Montgomery, Alabama. I, of course, canceled all my meetings, and I flew down as soon as I could. And when Brian's team picked me up, they spent the time to walk me around the city of Montgomery. And they pointed out all of the many markers in Montgomery that commemorate the history of the Confederacy and the very few which mention the history of slavery. And then he walked me to this hill that overlooked the whole city. And he pointed out the river and the train tracks where the largest domestic slave trading port in America had prospered. And then he pointed to the Capitol and its rotunda on which steps George Wallace had stood and said, segregation forever. And then he pointed to the ground below us. And he said, here, here we will build a new national memorial, one that will change the identity of this city and of this nation. Over the course of the last year and a half, our two teams have worked to design this memorial, which I'm pleased to share with you today. The memorial will take you on a journey through a familiar, almost classical building type, like the Parthenon or the colonnade at the Vatican. But as you enter, your perception shifts. The ground drops below you, and you begin to realize that these columns evoke the lynchings which happened in the public square. And as you continue, you begin to realize just the vast number of those who have yet to be put to rest, and their names will be engraved on the markers that hang above us. And just outside will be a field of identical columns of those above us, but these are temporary columns waiting in purgatory to be placed in the very counties of where these killings occurred. Over the course of the next few years, this site will bear witness as each of these markers is claimed and visibly placed in these counties. Our nation will begin to heal from over a century of silence. And when we thought about how we should build it, I was reminded of the lesson that Bruce taught me in Rwanda, Ubedehe. We wondered if we could collect the very soil from where these killings had occurred and include them in the markers themselves. Brian and his team have begun collecting that soil and filling, them, filling that soil into individual jars with community members and descendants of those that were killed. The act of collecting soil has led to a form of spiritual healing. It itself has been an act of restorative justice. As uh, one EJI team member noted in the collection of the soil of where Will McBride was lynched in Jefferson County in 1923, he said, if Will McBride left one drop of sweat, one drop of blood, one hair follicle, I pray that I dug it up and that now his whole body would be at peace. We will break ground on this memorial later this year uh, and it will be a, finally be a place where we can speak of the unspeakable acts that have scarred our nation. When my father told me that day that the house had saved his life, what I didn't realize was that he was speaking about a much deeper relationship between architecture and ourselves. Buildings are not simply expressive sculptures. They make visible our personal and our collective aspirations as a society, as a culture. 
Great architecture can give us hope. Great architecture can heal. Thank you very much.